Our guest speaker today is a fellow named Ace Wagner, and Ace is a, a very accomplished businessman. He's also a philosopher. Uh, he facilitates the Course in Miracles class here at the church. A very, very interesting person with something to say. So I present to you Mr. Ace Wagner. Thank you. Well, thank you, and good morning. I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about Father's Day here in a minute, but I wouldn't be the father that I am, nor would I have enjoyed it uh, without my loving wife and beautiful wife of 33 years this coming Friday. So this is my wife, Jan. I started coming into this building four, five, maybe six years ago, don't keep track, to attend A Course in Miracles just down the hall. And how many of you are familiar with A Course in Miracles? Just show me. You've heard of it? Okay, and how many of you read it front to back? <laughs> I'm the expert. I've read it. And so after coming to these classes for a few years, the woman who was facilitating A Course in Miracles had to move out of town. And so I was asked to facilitate along with my co-facilitator, Vic Martin. And I've enjoyed doing that work over the last couple of years. We've, we who come together regularly on Monday nights to study the work have decided that it is best done in group. We learn from each other in a very dynamic way. We read some of the material. We discuss it thoroughly. It's a very robust conversation. I'm telling you all this to say this is an invitation to you at any point in time. Now, we generally get a crowd of about this size, so it's not... <laughs> It's, it won't be easy to manage down in the heritage room, but I want you to know there's no beginning and there's no end, and you're welcome to come uh, join in with us at any point if you would like to. People often ask me, what is this Course in Miracles stuff? What is that about? And in the simplest of terms, it sets forth a contrast in the extreme for us to come to understand and asks and begs us to understand our true selves, our true identity our magnificence, and this love that pours through us, we are to be vehicles of that and conduit of that love. And it sets forth this in contrast because it describes for us the deceptions that we create for ourselves to think otherwise. And we find ourselves separate in these bodies from one another, and we find ourselves separate from this eternal flame, this true identity that we have. And it is in this contrast that A Course in Miracles tries to help us come to understand our magnificence, our majesty. So I enjoy the work. It is a, has been an awakening for me, and I invite you to participate with us. Now this father thing, I'm ever so pleased, and happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. By a show of hands, how many of you characters are out there today? How many fathers do we have in the room? Good smattering. I have enjoyed this fatherhood thing like nothing else in life. It has been a joy. It has been a source of inspiration. I have three beautiful children, all in their 20s now. I reveled in their youth and their God light shining to me. And now in their adulthood, we're co sojourners working together, learning from each other. They are my mentors, they are my friends. And we work to seek the light and understand our true identities together. If I make that sound too easy, and as though it's been too much fun, let me step back and tell you that each one of them has been a royal pain in the neck at somewhere along the line. <laughs> I fret, I worry with one of these children because the last couple of years have been really difficult. Difficult to the point that some of the mess-ups can affect one's life in a way that I don't want to see, nor does he. I'm proud of him, ever so proud. But I fret that perhaps my love has been conditioned and that I placed a veil between he and I as I try to father in the traditional patriarchal way. Rule, setting the standard and causing conditions to be set forth that miss the mark. It can happen easily. 
can't stand here before you without reminiscing about my own father. And if you'll indulge me for just a few seconds, this man was full of wisdom, quite a character, funny as get out, very successful businessman and entrepreneur in his own right. But he's been gone 32 years. I only lived 23 years with him here on earth. And so sometimes I forget the messages, the learning to bring into my own fatherhood from him. And I seek to remember those from time to time, particularly in these times of duress, these most difficult last few months, frankly. And so occasionally, I'll take that walk, that Saturday afternoon walk, seeking clarity, seeking some coherence, and trying to put my heart at rest to learn how I might best deal with my family and my situation. Now, mind you, my father called everyone a bird. It was a term of endearment, and we got so used to it, we did it ourselves. Hey, what are you birds doing for dinner Friday night? <laughs> you birds want to go sailing on Sunday? So much so that after his passing, it took a full year for the grave marker to be put in place. A piece of granite, simple. It was days until an ungodly dropping from the heavens <laughs> landed on this grave marker. We searched. Were others treated similarly? No, it was this grave marker. And certain family members went to clean this grave marker with their wire brushes. It was virtually indelible. And I'm talking for years this was there. It was one of the greatest jokes played by the spirit world on us humans, at least in my family. But he was quite a bird. And on a given Saturday, just a few weeks back, when my heart's a pound and I'm trying to think, what is it about how I can communicate with this child of mine to help him help himself? I finished the walk, but coming down my tree-lined street, not far from my home, a lone bird swept up under my arm and stopped stopped there on the road, and I'm talking five to six feet away. And I thought, surely he'll be gone in a moment. But he stared at me, and I stared it back. And I became quite verklempt very quick because I felt that energy. And at first, my head was full of messages telling me, hey, you know, you weren't the best preteen. You screwed up time and time again. And my mind was racing with those thoughts while my heart was full of an energy that was palpable and uplifting, and it caused me to cry. A grown man talking to a bird, <laughs> crying. But I felt that energy, and I felt it come to my heart, and a realization hit me in that minute. This was a collapsed minute, one of the ubiquitous and the ever-sought present moment. And it hit me in my heart, and it passed through. And this generation, with this generation, I hope speaking to that generation with nothing but an unadulterated, unmitigated love, which is the point of this ever-present love. And so this message came back to me. What I wanted to learn and the peace I sought, my father was powerfully transmitting to me. Bird stood there, and I had to move on at some point. And so, I started to walk away. And as I did now, 25, 30 paces away, I look back, and that bird's still looking at me. And I walk further, and I'm now 50 paces away, and I look back. <laughs> There's a car coming. That bird can't keep looking at me. He scampered off the road. The car came and then went up a hill. And that bird returned, and he took the same position, and he looked at me. I'm now 100, 125 paces away, really filled with a blessing, an energy. And I look back, and that bird is still looking at me. And so I take that around the corner, and I hold it in my heart, and I can only hope that I remember the message of that unmitigated, unconditional love, because that's a father's job. But friends, this was a choice I had to make. I could be distracted by the day and just move on with life and the pain of my life or awaken and stop for just a moment 
to recognize the message that was being conveyed by this one of God's creatures. Sometimes I don't know if I'm the problem or the solution. And recently at the annual physical, my doctor said, look, Ace, everything's fine. Anything else I can do for you? I said, anything else? Doc, it gets pretty personal in here. I can't imagine what more you got in mind. He said, no, I just wanted to know if there's something in your life, the family, anything I could help with. And I said, I've got to be honest with you. My wife is not hearing well. She simply doesn't hear me. And he said, bring her in. We'll run some tests. I said, she's far too proud for that. It isn't going to happen. He said, then speak to her in a normal tone with her back to you and cut the distance and just let me know how far away it is when she does hear you. So as it turns out, she's at the stove cooking our dinner. I happen to come through a side door and I'm now, I don't know, 30, 40 feet away in the dining room and I say to my wife, hello, honey, what's for dinner? Nothing. And I'm telling you, it pulls at my heartstrings that she can't hear. I cut the distance in half and I said, hello, honey, what's for dinner? Nothing. No response. And I'm really saddened, but I come right up behind her and I said, hi, honey, what's for dinner? And with a bit of a snarly look over her shoulder, she said, for the third time, it's chicken and noodles. <laughs> oh. It might be me. <laughs> and this realization and this story sticks with me because as we make these choices, we might best be thoughtful about from which we project onto others so that we can unwind from that, hopefully, and get to our true self as we do the evaluation necessary to move into each encounter each encounter demands of us, minute by minute, nanosecond by nanosecond, to awaken to the possibility that this light is ever-present, that this love is ever-present, and our job is to be a conduit of this love and this energy and to pass it through to each encounter and not filter it and not make it conditional and not mitigate it. So Duke has been talking to us here the last several weeks on this heart-centered Meditation, a short, brief meditation, where we breathe our air in against our heart organ, and we expel from under our solar plexus, and we calm ourselves down. This has worked for me. It's worked for me in some very trying times recently. And so I want to do more research on this. I want to get to the bottom. Where, where, where is this coming from? What's going on? And I come to find out that this heart of ours wants an electrical rhythm in a very tight sequence at about 0 0.10 hertz per millisecond. That's the electrical energy that the heart wants to regulate at. Our heads throw that heart out of balance with the stress of life. And thinking others have the hearing problem may lead to that stress because we're trying to fix them. And so when that happens, our little heart's rhythm is a bit all over the board, not where it wants to be. So when we do that exercise, I've come to find out it helps regulate not only our heart, but our body system follows that. Less tension, less hypertension, less inflammation. And our brain entrains electrically to that heart energy, making us more coherent. This little sucker beats 100,000 times a day. That's amazing. If you take heart tissue and you put it in a Petri dish to see how it does on its own, it will continue to beat. It takes this life energy, this universal life force, and it continues to vibrate until it shocks itself, filibrates, and dies. But if you take two pieces of heart tissue, two people, and you set them next to each other in that Petri dish, they continue to vibrate, they continue to beat, they support each other. We so long for that, to beat together. Entrainment happens when we recognize ourselves as one and not separate from this source. This heart has an electromagnetic energy that extends 
to others. It's 5,000 times more electromagnetic than the head, than the brain energy. I find that fascinating. A few years ago, a mentor of mine told me a story that I believe relates to this heart energy. There were two anthropologists who were dispatched out to two separate camps in an African country someplace to live with gorillas. The camps weren't far from one another, but they didn't intermingle. The anthropologists were of a similar statue, similar educational background from the same race, and they emanated from the same university. All things being equal, the goal of the test was to just discern what differences may come about. The first anthropologist reported back after nearly 11 months of living in the camp with the gorillas. He had a riveting experience. He loved the exposure with these gorillas. They, they frolicked in his tent, the young ones. He was able to hold small gorillas. He was invited to share meals with them from a moderate distance. He loved it. The second anthropologist didn't have it quite so good. He spent most of his time sitting by a fear, by a tree full of fear and fret. He was anxious, he was nervous. And when he did try to engage with the gorillas in their camp, they didn't want him near. They, they warded him off. So the two got together after their, their experiments to compare notes. And they were baffled, dumbfounded, as to why they would be treated so differently. The second anthropologist got around to admitting, I had a gun in my boot. Oh, a variable in the experiment. The gorillas didn't see the gun, the gun wasn't shot, but he had a gun in his boot. And as is often said here at Unity, we create our own reality. So as we think about a defensiveness and a gun being carried into the situation, what reality are we creating? If you're a single person interested in a long-term loving human relationship, you might ask yourself, which anthropologist am I going into the possibility of relationship? Now, if I or some other meathead cuts you off in traffic when you leave here, you might stop and say, whose day am I ruining with the anger and the reality that you might create from the frustration that goes with that? These are choices. And they're made minute by minute and nanosecond by nanosecond. And the more aware we are of the possibility that we are that eternal flame and that love and a conduit of those, I think the more joy we may get from our existence. Now, finally, I was riveted at a funeral of a family friend, a friend you know that you say hello to in the grocery store, that you raised your kids together in church, as we did. Her name was Terry Lamano. Terry was viciously murdered at Village Shalom just a couple of months back. I went to her funeral. The words spoken were the words of a woman with an open heart. Over and over, the speakers, without coordinating their thoughts, had spoken of her as someone who was open to the possibility, and her heart was open. Her 20-year-old son, my son's grade school friend, and a member of my youth soccer team when I was a coach in the old days, he took the podium. How? I don't know. But he took the podium, and he spoke loving words about his mother. But at the end, he said, I know what this killer's words were. My mother's words were to this killer. I know her final words. How bold. He said, I know she said, stop. Think about what you were doing. He said, because she said that to me 10,000 times before. So I ask you fathers, stop. Think about what you were doing. Each and every encounter will mount up in a way that can pile love into love and you become a conduit and your unmitigated, unconditional love will be a gift to your children like none other. And I say to the rest of you birds, <laughs> when you go out and interact with the gorillas in that world out there, just think about which anthropologist you want to be. So we take these thoughts into our meditation this morning. On this day.
this point in our service, we begin a meditation. Assume a posture that's comfortable to you. Focus on your breathing. And today, focus on your heart. Your metaphorical heart, your physical beating heart, the one. And as you breathe, draw your fresh breath against your heart. Let it refresh, let it restore your heart. Thank you. 